This is a statistics course, or sometimes I joke, it's an anti-statistics course. It's a statistics course for people, like all of you, who'd rather just not take a statistics course. What you'd rather do is some science, or some research. Uh, you're interested in natural things, or they're birds, or plants, or people, uh, or the physical forces that move them. And that leads you into research. And then when you get into research, your goal is to connect data you might collect about these entities to scientific models that explain regularities in their lives. And these scientific models uh, often, but not always, are expressed mathematically. So how do we make this connection? And that connection is made through a branch of applied mathematics called statistics. But the interest in this course is in the science and how the science motivates the statistical reasoning and how it connects to the data. There's a book uh, that I wrote a few years ago. It's in its second edition. Uh, and in this series of lectures, I'm revising uh, this book uh, quite actively uh, to eventually become a third edition. So if you've taken this course before, welcome back. Uh, there will be some new things and I hope it'll be worth your time. Uh, what am I doing that's different? There's not a complete overhaul. It's basically the same course uh, with the same major components. Uh, there's a Bayesian core to it, and that will stay. Uh, what's different? I'm, I think there have become too many examples over the years, and I want to trim them back to a few core examples that I can develop in complexity over a series of lectures and do each in more depth. I want to focus much more on the workflow of doing scientific research uh, and in testing the code we develop as we go. Um, more examples of computing the things that we're really after as scientists, that is hypothetical interventions. Um, and one version of that is this post stratification that those of us who also do descriptive research uh, often need. Um, and I've felt guilty over the years that very important topics like measurement error and missing data appear at the end of the course, making them seem like they're optional. And a lot of people, let's face it, never make it that far. So I wanna foreground these issues because they're present in most research projects and they deserve to be taken seriously and become a core piece of our kit. Uh, and finally, I'd like to do a few examples of sensitivity analysis, which is something lots of people have asked for uh, and uh, something that I've found very useful in my own research. So if you're enrolled in the course, you'll have access to um, the draft as I develop it. And you'll know you're working on the third edition draft because there'll be these peach boxes rather than blue boxes. This revised version of the course is going to focus on three components in all of the examples. The first is DAGs. I'll explain what that is in a moment. And the second is golems. If you're returning to the course, you know what golems are and they're still here. And then the third is owls. Let me explain each of these in turn for the remainder of this lecture, our introductory lecture. So often in statistics, especially in Bayesian statistics courses, there's lots of discussion of the differences between Bayesian inference and frequentism, which is the other major paradigm by which uh, statistics is done. We're not going to talk about that at all uh, in this course. Uh, the statistics wars are over for the most part. Uh, they're just a thing that boomer statisticians talk about. Uh, we're much more interested in how we justify our statistical procedures, whether they're Bayesian or not. And that leads us to focus more on a field called causal inference, which is a very diverse field with lots of tools. It's a field that puts science before statistics, or rather, works really hard to make statistics serve scientific goals, explicit scientific goals. Often uh, statistics is taught um, in the absence of uh, scientific models, but we're not going to do that here. So for, and we're not going to do that because in order for statistical models, which are devices that process data to produce estimates, for them to produce scientific insight, they require some firm logical connection to a scientific model. And so we're going to draw scientific models, sometimes called causal models. And in causal models, scientific models, changing a variable will change only some other variables. And those are what we call causes. 
the truth is that for any given sample, um, a statistical analysis can find any cause it wants in the absence of a causal model. That is, uh, people sometimes say the reasons for the statistical analysis are not found in the data themselves. We cannot troll through the numbers and come up with the theory, or at least we really shouldn't. Uh, rather, we have to put causes in in order to design the right statistical model that will give us an estimate that we're after. So the causes of the data cannot be extracted from the data alone. We need an additional external model, a causal model of some kind. Uh, there's a philosopher of science, Nancy Cartwright, who has this great slogan, uh, no causes in, no causes out. So what is causal inference? Uh, there'll be lots of examples as we go through the course, and there are whole books on this topic. Um, just want to give you an intuition to start here. Uh, so often the first thing you hear about causal inference is that uh, correlation does not imply causation. Uh, and it doesn't, of course, but uh, causation doesn't even imply correlation, it turns out. I'll have an example later on. Uh, this is a deep and um, uh, interesting topic uh, 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 to explore over many weeks. Um, the associations between variables run in both directions is the basic problem. And this is what we mean when, when someone says correlation does not imply causation. We should swap the word correlation for association. Because correlation is a, is a very limited measure of association. Right? Uh, the, the variables can be associated but have no correlation. So we're going to uh, think more about associations between variables rather than correlations. Um, but associations are, are bidirectional. Uh, there's no causation in them. They're just statistical measures. Uh, causal inference is about what happens when um, we take some action. There's some intervention that's done. And then there's directionality. Uh, let me give you some examples uh, in under two basic categories. The first is that causal inference can be thought of as the prediction of the consequences of an intervention. It's not just the prediction uh, of what happens in the absence of your intervention. It's not just... It's, prediction of associations in the future. It's prediction of the consequences of changing one variable on other variables. Or it can be thought of as the imputation of missing observations. I'll explain both of these in turn. So if you look outside and there's any wind and there are any trees, uh, then the trees will be swaying in the wind. Now, you know that the wind is causing the trees to sway, but those variables, the, the movement of the trees and the presence of the wind, are merely statistically associated. And there's nothing about that statistical association which tells you the causal information. It's something else you know as a person. Uh, if you, and this has implications for hypothetical interventions. When you know the cause of, say, the swaying of the trees, that means you're able to predict the consequences of a particular intervention. That is, adding wind makes them sway. Uh, climbing up in the tree and swaying the branches does not create wind. Well, it doesn't create very much wind. It'll create a very small amount of local wind. And so the causal inference is the what if I do this kind of question. This is the consequences of an intervention. This is very different than, than pure or raw prediction. Uh, because if all you know is the statistical association between wind and the swaying of branches, you can predict the presence of wind when you see the trees sway. And that's a purely statistical prediction, and that can be very useful. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but causal prediction is distinct. It's the consequences of an intervention of a particular kind. The other uh, type that I mentioned was causal imputation. And this would mean you know the cause. Um, when you know a cause, you're able to construct or reconstruct unobserved counterfactual outcomes. What if something else had happened? And if you understand a scientific system and you understand the causes that drive it, you'll be able to do this as well, right? So what if another country had been the first to land on the moon? What would have been different in history? Now, no one can answer that question. That's the kind of causal imputation uh, that we cannot do. Uh, but there are uh, more simple systems in which we understand and we can do this kind of imputation. Causal inference uh, is one kind of research goal, but it's intimately related to um, at least two others, uh, description and research, uh, the description of populations and uh, the design of research projects. 
And the thing that binds these three together is that they all depend upon some scientific model to be conducted effectively. So causal inference can only be done if we have a causal model uh, at some level of abstraction. Uh, description as well, descriptive studies also depend upon causal knowledge because, uh, as I'll explain, um, uh, there are causes of the sample that we use to, to conduct the description. And research design, uh, I hope it's obvious, um, depends upon some causal knowledge of the system we're, we're designing to study. So I want to pause for a moment on this particular issue about description, because I've, I've found with various audiences it's not always intuitive. Uh, sometimes causal inference and description are presented as opposite kinds of scientific goals, and um, people will talk about descriptive studies, and they're not going to make any causal claims. Uh, that's fine. Uh, I do a lot of descriptive work. I'm an anthropologist. I think probably most anthropological research is descriptive. Nevertheless, this is no way out of causal modeling and the causal inference literature. You still have to study it. And the reason is because the sample is caused by things. Uh, and those things uh, need to be drawn with a causal logic to help you understand whether you can design around them or calculate around them. That is that the sample differs from the population. And if, you can, or if your goal is to describe that population, that requires modeling the causes of the sample and why it differs from the population. So there are going to be lots of causal diagrams in this course. Uh, and these causal diagrams are called DAGs. Uh, DAG stands for Directed Acyclic Graph. Uh, there's a picture of one in the upper right of this slide. And we'll talk a lot about these in more detail in, in later lectures. What I want you to understand now is that these are highly abstract causal models. I use the word heuristic here, um, uh, but you can think of them as being abstract in that the only information in a, in a DAG is uh, the names of variables, which are the letters, and their causal relationships, which are the arrows. <clears throat> and an arrow indicates that if you um, change a, a variable at the start of the arrow, it will also induce a change in the variable at the end of the arrow, uh, but not in the reverse. Uh, so for example, um, on this slide, if you look at X and Y, there's an arrow going from X to Y. So if you change X, uh, Y would change according to this diagram. But if you change Y, X would not change. And those are interventions. So what a DAG tells you is the consequences of a hypothetical intervention. And we can use, use DAGs, we can analyze them to figure out which statistical models we need to answer particular specified questions um, about the variables in the graph and about particular hypothetical interventions. In, in a sense, uh, and that's all the that DAGs have in them, DAGs don't make any specific assumptions about the relationships between these variables. They just name influences. So they don't assume that things are linear. Uh, and by default, they assume that all variables interact. There's, everything is moderation in, in the language of psychologists. Uh, so they're useful uh, for lots of reasons. Uh, I'll try to demonstrate to you. But one of the things that I like about them is that they answer very general questions about what we can decide without making additional assumptions. Eventually, we will make additional assumptions. We will make assumptions about the functional relationships between these variables, and that'll give us more scientific power. But the DAG has usefulness even after we do that. So let's talk a little bit more about this, this first DAG. And this maybe looks a little bit complicated. I want to break it down into the kinds of relationships that, that you have to specify in these things uh, and why we need to do it. Uh, so the first, let's gray out most of the DAG and just talk about the relationship between X and Y. So in most research, or in the simplest research, we're interested in the, the causal effect of one variable, here X, on another, here Y. And we call this uh, the treatment X uh, and the outcome Y. Uh, and uh, this relationship goes in one direction, uh, at least at one moment in time. Uh, in a time series, you can have reciprocal relationships, but I'm not showing that here. Um, there are other variables in the world, and these other variables influence uh, X and Y. And how they influence X and Y and how they influence one another is something, it turns out, we need to draw out as well in order to study the relationship between X and Y. 
So there are variables like b on the right hand side here, which are uh, competing causes of y. They're, they're um, like x, but we're not interested in them. And nevertheless, it can be useful to measure them, uh, these competing causes. And then there are variables like a, which are influences of the treatment. And these are also things uh, that we might be concerned about um, uh, at times. And then there are variables like C, which are common causes of X and Y together. Now C, uh, to foreground things a little bit, is a confound. Um, it's the kind of variable that we would want to control for in a statistical analysis so that we could correctly estimate the relationship between X and Y. However, uh, variables like C and A and B have relationships among themselves, and those relationships among the other variables can uh, confuse uh, our regression strategies. And we're going to return to this particular example uh, a little bit later, um, and I'll highlight how for you. <clears throat> so let me try to summarize a little bit. So the thing about a causal model like, like the DAG on the screen is you can ask multiple questions of it. You don't only have to ask what's the influence of X on Y. You can also ask about the influence of A on Y uh, and so on. Um, and, and the key insight is that you will need multiple statistical models to do that, that each causal query will imply a different statistical procedure, a different estimate. And in many cases, you will not be able to use one statistical model to answer all of those causal queries for reasons I'll teach you. Um, it comes down to the issue of choosing uh, what some fields call control variables. And it turns out that there are good controls uh, absolutely, there are variables you want to add because adding them controls for some confounding influence and lets you correctly measure a causal influence. But it's not safe to just add everything and see what happens to the coefficients because there are also bad controls. There are variables that create confusion when you add them to the model. They create bias and mess up your estimates. Um, so one of the things that the DAG lets you do is avoid those hazards, assuming that the DAG is correct. Um, and another thing that the DAG does is it provides a clear route for testing and refining the causal model because it's logically specified and you can deduce its implications. One of the things that DAGs do, even independent of doing a data analysis, is that they're intuition pumps. They get the researcher's head out of the data, out of the numbers, and into the science. And then we can go back into the data and make more sense of it. Okay, so you have a DAG, you have a strategy for which control variables you want to use. You still need a statistical model. And in this course, we call statistical models, models golems, which is a metaphor from the book. Let me try to explain where this comes from. It comes from Prague. So Prague in the 16th century was part of a continental empire, uh, the Holy Roman Empire, and there were many uh, learned uh, uh, scholars and artists and other sorts of people there. It was quite a happening place. And it was also a multicultural community. It had a large urban Jewish community uh, led by this fellow here, Rabbi Lov. And there was, um, uh, as the legend goes, a certain amount of uh, discrimination and blood libel against the Jews of Prague at the time. And according to legend, Rabbi Lov uh, used magic, uh, Kabbalah, to construct um, a clay robot. A golem, probably the one of the world's first robots. And uh, uh, again, according to legend, this clay robot was used to defend the Jews um, against uh, attacks, against libel. But uh, mistakes were made, and innocent people were accidentally hurt by it. And so uh, Rabbi Lov decommissions at the end of the legend the clay robot and swears never again to toy with the power of creation. I really like the golem legend. Uh, and if you go to Prague, you'll see it's a big tourist attraction. You can buy golem cookies and, and trinkets and earrings and all sorts of things. Uh, but it's a wonderful story, especially in the contemporary world, because we're surrounded by robots of all kinds. And they're not always physical. They're just software or something else, um, but also physical robots. And these robots, like the golem, are built for a particular task, but they're blind to our intent uh, when we make them. There's nothing about their their programming, which understands the intent and can interpret it and reprogram themselves um, in that light. And so if they're not used wisely and in only the right contexts, they can do severe damage. And there's a lot 
of ethical responsibility, which comes from deploying uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and statistical models, because they're all basically the same kind of thing. They're golems. And we're going to make golems. Uh, and hopefully we're not going to wreck prog. Um, these are uh, our golems, uh, our computer programs, um, but computer programs also run on clay. They run on silicon. Like the golem, they're powerful, but they have no wisdom or foresight. They merely execute the instructions we've given them, and so they can be quite dangerous when used inappropriately. And I want to spend a little bit of time talking about one particular tradition in statistics, which is very golem-like in that there's nothing essentially bad about the golem. The golem didn't mean to hurt anyone. Uh, and statistical models are the same. Uh, they're not bad. They're good for particular things. They're designed with um, really interesting logic and they're quite powerful, uh, but they're applied in the wrong context and they're applied too broadly and they can do damage. And the, the tradition in statistics I want to focus on is this tradition that many people learn in their first introductory stats course, probably when they were getting their first degree in the sciences. And it's this idea that you use flowcharts, uh, answer a few simple questions, and select some sort of statistical test for testing a null hypothesis. Now, I have nothing against the individual tests in this when used in the right place, uh, but this is not the kind of curriculum to train research scientists. This is the kind of curriculum for basic quality control and experimental science. Uh, each of the little um, devices in here, like a, a Spearman's rank correlation or a t-test, is extremely useful, but it's also extremely narrow. Um, this is a very limiting uh, uh, picture of statistics to give people. And I say, by the way, this has nothing to do with um, uh, old uh, boomer arguments about Bayes versus frequentism. Uh, there are Bayesian versions of every one of these procedures. So this has nothing to do with that. It's about the tradition of teaching students and researchers these little isolated tests and letting them test uh, and teaching them that the sole goal of statistics is to reject null hypotheses. Now, there are certainly contexts in which rejecting null hypotheses is very useful, I think. Lots of experimental work, for example, uh, industrial quality control. There are lots of reasons to do that. But in most of research science, it is not a useful goal. And I want to spend some time arguing that position for you. Oh, I wanted to say something about industrial framework at the bottom. Yeah, so a number of these tests were invented for industrial work, uh, and they're very important, like quality control. So uh, the t-test, some of you may know, um, was developed by William, William Seeley Gossett, who was a statistician who was working for Guinness Brewery in Dublin, uh, seen here. And Guinness Brewery uh, was one of the first really ambitious breweries to do um, science with their beer. They wanted uh, customers, when they ordered a Guinness anywhere in the world, to be, get the same experience. Uh, every bat of Guinness should taste the same. They're like the McDonald's of beer. I hope no one's offended by that because it's a compliment. Right, you can go uh, to a McDonald's anywhere in the world and the cheeseburger tastes the same, for better or worse. Uh, and the same for Guinness. Not everybody likes Guinness, but if you do, uh, everywhere in the world you go, it will taste the same. And that's because of science. They scienced it. And the t-test was designed to do small batch testing on Guinness. And it's extremely useful that way. It's the kind of industrial control settings that in introductory statistics curriculum is extremely useful. Uh, but many of us do study much more complicated systems, uh, even if they're experimental, and most of us study systems in which the, the ability to do experimental interventions is incredibly limited. Either it's not practical, uh, practically impossible, or it's wholly unethical. And so we study observational systems, and in such systems, uh, null models are not unique. That is, it's, it's typically not possible to define a uh, clear and sensible null hypothesis that can be rejected. What we have to do instead is design multiple process models and study their implications. And so, for example, I may ask you, what's a null population dynamic? Population dynamics is the study of how entities in a population change over time as they influence one another. What does it mean for a population dynamic to be null or neutral? Uh, null phylogenies, um, null ecological communities, a null social network. People do reject null hypotheses about all of these things, um, but I don't think this is sensible. Let me spend a little bit of time talking about some of these examples. So in population genetics, 
uh, and this is an example that, that I was taught in graduate school, there was this um, historical uh, fight between neutral theory and, well, everybody else. Uh, the book on the left, and just as an exemplar of the so-called selectionists, uh, Gillespie, uh, the book on the right. Uh, and the scientific issue here is a really interesting one. It's about population dynamics. How does DNA evolve over time? And the DNA molecules are complex, and the question and they vary. The question is, where does that variation come from? Which forces of evolution strongly contribute to it? And um, under the neutral theory of molecular evolution, the idea isn't that there's no selection. It's just that most of the molecular structure of DNA is neutral variation, non-coding variation. That's not important to phenotype, um, most in the population. And uh, so let's break this down a little bit. <clears throat> So we could have some vague hypothesis. Evolution is neutral, which is to say that selection doesn't influence uh, uh, the molecule that much, even though obviously uh, adaptation happens. Uh, this is, no one's denying that. Um, and that hypothesis is too vague to compare to any data. So you need some mathematical model and population geneticists um, make mathematical models of population dynamics. And those models have particular assumptions. So if you make a process model of, of molecular, molecular evolution where there's no selection at all, we call this a neutral model, um, you also have to make other assumptions like how does the population size fluctuate and what's the life cycle of the organism like? Um, you can't get away from making assumptions about those things. And so one particular process model that that people studied who were interested in neutral evolution was the neutral equilibrium model. The equilibrium model, the population size stays the same. And this implies a particular statistical uh, test to uh, test whether um, some population meets that distribution. You can think about the statistical model on the right as being some distributional implication of the process model. There are other process models which you might also call neutral. For example, there could be a non-equilibrium model in which population size fluctuates, and it turns out you get different distributions of DNA molecules uh, under that model. And then the really frustrating thing in the history of this topic, um, and under the vague hypothesis on the left, selection matters, you can also make multiple process models. Uh, and so for example, a constant selection model, directional selection model, the kind of first cartoon version of natural selection that the biology students are taught, uh, very unrealistic, but it's a model, um, has some particular um, statistical implications labeled here M3 on the far right. But there's another kind of uh, process model of selection uh, uh, that Gillespie and others made, which, in which selection fluctuates. And it turns out the fluctuating selection models can make the same distributional predictions as the neutral equilibrium model. The null model is not unique. Uh, and so now you can test uh, whether evolution is neutral, uh, and it's not. Um, uh, but the point here is not who was right. It's that to do our data processing correct correctly, we're going to need process models, and we're going to have to look away from the goal of rejecting a null. This same kind of drama has played out in multiple fields. So in ecology, in the study of biodiversity, there was this um, theory of the, the unified neutral theory of biodiversity, which is essentially the neutral model applied to ecological communities, the idea that there are no species differences structuring communities. Um, unfortunately, this has the same problems. It's not really a causal model. Um, and the quote I have here on the screen is one of my favorites is from James Clark. Uh, Equal probability is not a theory, but a lack of one. It does not include or exclude any process relevant to coexistence of competitors. Models lacking explicit species can make useful predictions, but this does not support neutral theory. Right? So the, the predictions of a, of a particular model lacking forces uh, does not show that that's the model that's, that's producing it. We need other causal models, and, and we need to look at where they're different. Um, even a little bit older, uh, in the late 70s and early 80s in ecology, there was this fight between some giants in ecology. Uh, Simberloff and, and uh, Diamond were the uh, most aggressive in this, as I understand the history. And the idea here was they were interested, again, in community ecology, which species co-occur, uh, the study of coexistence and at competitive exclusion. And um, Connor and Simberloff had a, me a method of permuting matrices, like the ones you see, the one you see on the right here, of the presence of species in particular locations, to te to test and reject null models uh, of whether species um, uh, co-occurred or not. 
And uh, the, the basic problem here is, well, these methods just don't work. Uh, there's no argument about that now. And Diamond and Gilpin uh, wrote a quite aggressive takedown of it here. You could quote the null hypothesis analysis by Conrad Simbolov is characterized by hidden structure, inefficiency, lack of common sense, imprudence, and statistical weakness, and ultimately by a scandalous disregard for their own procedure. Wow. Okay. So I don't think we should write criticism uh, in this tone, but it is true that the Conrad Simbolov procedure just doesn't work. It has very low power and a very high false positive rate. And the basic problem is there is no unique way to permute a matrix to meet any particular null model. There's a lot of information built into a data matrix, like the one you see on the screen, that cannot be permuted away. And this is a huge problem. Now we can study species co-occurrence, but we can't do it by creating some artificial null matrix uh, with the species present in it. Uh, the same problem arises in the study of social networks, another case where there are permutation methods. Um, people used to use these permutation methods because that's all they knew how to do. Uh, but again, they just don't work. They don't do what they claim to be able to do. Uh, so here's a, a paper from Hart et al. Uh, recently in 2021, which summarizes this, which has been known for decades, actually. Um, these methods, like quadratic assignment procedures, simply do not statistically do what we think they do. And the reason is because there is no clear, unique null network. More recently, uh, another example, just to prime your imagination. So you may have heard um, that uh, Neanderthals, which were, uh, uh, well, some people say the same species, some people say a different species. Let's just say they were very, very similar to humans. Uh, and they lived uh, mainly in Europe, but also in the Near East. Um, and are now extinct. And you may have heard that all humans outside of Africa um, have DNA from Neanderthals, that, that, which uh, seems to suggest that Neanderthals and modern humans interbred. Um, so all living humans evolved in Africa after Neanderthals evolved in Europe. And so uh, one model of the interbreeding is that, and you see this on the map, when modern humans um, arise, uh, shown in red, um, and leave Africa. They, they interact with Neanderthals and they interbreed and they have some families together. Eventually Neanderthals go extinct, but the surviving humans carry that Neanderthal DNA with them. There's no Neanderthal DNA in Africa because modern Africans, they're just as modern as the rest of us, never had that population history of interacting uh, with Neanderthals. Uh, so it's something like two or 3% in, in people like me of, of European ancestry. Um, and we study this at my institute uh, here in Leipzig, uh, for example. Well, I don't, my colleagues do. Uh, but there are other um, uh, hypotheses here. It's not sufficient here to simply test the null hypothesis of no Neanderthal DNA in modern humans outside of Africa, which you can reject. You can reject the null hypothesis that people like me don't have any Neanderthal DNA. Okay, and the early papers on this topic, that's what they did. They rejected the null hypothesis um, of no Neanderthal DNA. Uh, there's not a lot, but there, it's there. It's not zero. Um, but there are other process models consistent with the same fact. Uh, so for example, uh, there could uh, be Neanderthal DNA, uh, uh, what looks like Neanderthal DNA in people like me, because of ancient population substructure in the human population. There are lots of humans and they're geographically really dispersed and local populations have different neutral molecular variation that we can use to identify people from those places. This is neutral variation, it doesn't influence phenotype at all, uh, but it lets us track who's related to who. And so uh, Neanderthals, uh, also left Africa, um, or rather the ancestors of Neanderthals also left Africa long ago, um, and then the ancestors of modern humans um, after that. And in that process, they would have both passed through uh, Northeast Africa where it connects to Asia. And so any substructure in the African population uh, could be transmitted to both groups, any group leaving Africa. And so we could share what looks like uh, Neanderthal DNA with Neanderthals because we we and Neanderthals both got it from um, northeastern African populations, which are now extinct. And this is called the ancient substructure hypothesis. And both of those are consistent with rejecting the null hypothesis uh, of no Neanderthal DNA. So it's just not enough uh, to study these processes that way. Now you can test these two hypotheses against one another, but you have to consider them as process models and see what implications they have and then look at the data differently. Uh, you can't just reject the null hypothesis. 
Okay, let me try to summarize some of that. I know it's a lot. Um, and those examples were just meant to, to show you in realistic research contexts that this null hypothesis framework is very limiting. And we want to think instead of scientific models and how to uh, introduce those scientific models to data by analyzing them to design golems. And those golems, at least in this class, will not be designed to test null hypotheses. They'll be designed to do much more. Um, what we're going to need to make those golems are generative causal models, uh, not just DAGs. DAGs, are, DAGs don't have enough um, details to them to be generative. Generative means you can simulate data from the model. Uh, so we're going to start with DAGs, but then we're going to turn them into generative models that can produce synthetic data. And then we're going to write statistical models uh, that can analyze the synthetic data to begin with to produce certain um, uh, goals called estimands to answer particular questions. Uh, and then once we're sure that the model works in principle on the synthetic data uh, designed in light of, the, of a specific transparent generative model, then we'll introduce the real data to it. So let's come back to the DAG and walk through this in a heuristic fashion and think about this, this issue of justifying controls. So one of the things about statistical modeling is that we're interested in a relationship between two particular variables, say x and y, and we know we have other variables. Should we use any of them in the analysis? And this is, this is the kind of question I'm going to assert and teach you cannot be answered in the absence of a generative model, or, or at least some kind of causal model. Um, what's the basic problem? Well, there are lots of particular, say, regression models, those of you who've already had a course in regression, uh, models that model y uh, using its association with multiple other variables. So on the left here, I've listed some of the possibilities here. We could have a model where we only look at the, the association between y and x, which is the relationship of interest. Uh, we could have one where uh, we also add the variable a, the second model on the screen. We could look at a and b together with x. We could do x plus c. We could do x plus a and c, x plus b and c, and I've left off the one that has them all. Um, which of these should we use? And this is one of the most common um, uh, uh, questions that we have in applied statistics is which covariates or controls to add. And you cannot decide this without at least a DAG and um, uh, hopefully even more than that, some more generative model that specifies the shape of the relationships among these variables. Uh, and the reason is because the relationships among the variables cause problems for us when we add control variables. And what we want to do, and I'll teach you in later lectures, is analyze a graph like this so that we can deduce, given the, the assumptions in this graph, which control variables are good and which control variables are bad. In this particular example, and I'll, I won't explain this today, but I'll show you uh, in a future lecture, the correct adjustment set is what it's called, is to uh, include the variables B and C in the model, to stratify by B and C when examining the relationship between X and Y. And again, I'm not going to explain today why. I just want to whet your appetite for it. In a future lecture, I'll explain why only these two. Okay, so we've used the DAG, we've analyzed it, we have our adjustment set, this is not enough. Um, as I mentioned before, we want a generative version of the causal model so we can design and debug our code, and we're gonna do that in even the first example um, in the next lecture. Uh, and then we need some strategy to create an estimate, and there are different ways to do it. Um, that is, we need, what's our, uh, um, strategy for coping with finite data to study something about a population uh, that could in potential produce infinite data? And how do we properly characterize the uncertainty in the estimate we produce? And the easiest approach, uh, at least I feel, is Bayesian data analysis. I don't use it out of some philosophical commitment. I use it because I'm a scientist and Bayesian data analysis lets me take the generative assumptions in my scientific models and confront them with data with the least fuss. So I have to admit that uh, um, sometimes Bayes is overkill. And often, uh, I think a problem in courses that teach Bayesian statistics is they teach very simple examples where it, 
there don't seem to be any real advantages of the Bayesian approach. So Bayesian linear regression, extremely similar to non-Bayesian linear regression, uh, but there's additional fuss. So this is a bit like cutting a birthday cake with a chainsaw. It works, uh, it's stylish, and it produces a lot of additional mess. You might as well just use a cake knife. Um, but the interest in Bayes here really is practical because outside the birthday cake scenario, in a realistic analysis, like you need to cut a tree down, uh, Bayes can do it. Uh, so what do I mean to carry this, this metaphor forward? Um, in realistic analyses, we routinely have to deal with measurement error, missing data, latent variables, and uh, goals like regularization. And I'll explain what these things mean as we go forward, but uh, this, these are not exotic problems. They're routine problems in scientific research, especially at the cutting edge where we're just figuring out measurement. And Bayes has very natural and comfortable ways to deal with these problems. Um, uh, you can do it in other, in other frameworks, but it's harder. Uh, and so um, Bayes has, begot, has gotten a lot more popular in research in recent decades, I think exactly for this reason, is that the interest is practical, not philosophical. Whatever philosophical commitments people had one way or the other, uh, uh, we don't discuss those things so much anymore. In particular, one of the nice things about Bayesian modeling is that Bayesian statistical models are generative. They can simulate data like a causal model. And this allows us to express our Bayesian statistical models to a very close identity with the causal models of interest. So I hinted at this just now. I, I think the statistics wars are over. They feel like they're over, at least. Um, there was a time when Bayesian statistics was controversial. Uh, uh, early 20th century, uh, but it's, that's no longer true. It's extremely mainstream now. I mean, there are some fields like social psychology where uh, it's still considered a bit taboo, people tell me, but in biology, uh, people, if they use a Bayesian technique, they'll often put it right in the title even, or, or at least in the abstract, because it's a bit uh, prestigious to do it. Uh, I don't think it should be necessarily it's just probability theory, as I'll, I'll teach you in the next lecture, uh, but the point is the wars are over, and we shouldn't uh, talk about uh, Bayes frequentist combat any longer. Um, I do think there's a problem with um, university curriculum still catching up. In most places there aren't dedicated teaching slots for people to teach applied Bayesian data analysis, but we're getting there. It's becoming much more common because people are using Bayes more in their research than there are classes to teach it, and this creates problems in use and leaves people feeling that they don't have a floor beneath them. Uh, so it's just going to take some time um, for the curriculum to catch up, uh, but we're getting there. I also think that that a lot of the research innovation, the action, is in machine learning circles now, and they have their own battles to fight. Uh, so we can we can let uh, the remaining uh, uh, boomer combatants fight about Bayesian frequentism. Uh, let them fight. Uh, we have our own battles. Okay, last topic in this introductory lecture. I want to talk about owls. Um, so some of you have seen this internet joke about how to draw an owl. Uh, the joke begins by saying, well, step one, you draw some circles, one, uh, or rather ellipses, one for the head and one for the body. And then step two is you draw the rest of the owl. Okay, haha. -ha. Um, I think the joke is funny. At least it was the first hundred times I saw it. Uh, I want to use this as a metaphor for how we teach, well, computational tasks in, in research. Not just uh, statistics, but all kinds of programming and technical things are often taught like this. There's some uh, guide to how to do it, and, and they tell you how to do the initial steps, and there are a bunch of steps between one and two here um, that seem to go by really fast. Uh, so we want to move more, more slowly. We want to draw out all the intermediate steps uh, in drawing the owl so that the student has some hope of finding out which part, which step they're having trouble with, and learning effectively. And this naturally means it takes more time. It takes more time both from the teacher and from the students, uh, but it's much more successful uh, when you want to draw the owl to get all the steps. And we're interested in documenting our steps of drawing the owl, so to speak. And what this means is we're going to have an explicit workflow where we set up our code so that we have our generative simulation in step one and we write an estimator in step two, and then we validate that estimator in step three using the simulated data. And then in step four, uh, we analyze real data. And we have all this documentation uh, in the flow. 
uh, and then uh, I'll show you some other step fives and things we'll, we can reuse um, uh, the uh, step one code to do things like uh, compute hypothetical interventions and other very useful uh, tasks. So drawing the Bayesian owl, uh, it's necessary because scientific data analysis is a very bizarre kind of software engineering. It's like software engineering done by amateurs who've not been taught anything about software engineering. Right. Now, this is an unfortunate state of affairs, but most data analysis in the sciences uh, uh, now uh, is done with scripting. Uh, there are some people who still do point and click, and that's terrible for reasons I'll get to. But scripting is a kind of, of uh, programming, a simple kind of programming, and you should approach it like that and be, uh, test that the software works and document it and comment it appropriately. Um, we want quality control and quality assurance. So there's kind of three modes to drawing the Bayesian owl that we'll do in this course. Uh, the first mode is you want to understand what you're doing and breaking it down into steps and having a recipe and a workflow that you that you uh, hold yourself to is extremely useful for that. Otherwise, you'll just have a salad of code and you'll get lost in which version of the code you need. Uh, lots of people have done that. Uh, and hopefully, they only do it once and they learn from the experience. Um, Documenting your work reduces error. This, is, this isn't just about understanding, it's about reducing scientific error as well and giving your colleagues some faith that your, that your code actually works. Uh, and so on, this is the most important part of this is uh, we're professionals and we should behave professionally. Uh, we want a respectable scientific workflow that we're not afraid uh, to describe to our colleagues, right? What we don't want to do is be asked to see the research code and say, well, I'm not sure I can find it. And then you find it and you can't find out which script it is and you're not sure how this works and you can't get it to run. There's too much of that going on in the sciences and we must stop. Uh, this is a profession, right? The public isn't paying us to goof off. Uh, we want to work responsibly so we can get things right or so when errors arise, and they always do, we can find them and correct them. So uh, the steps of the, uh, the basic drawing the Bayesian owl are first, we have to define some theoretical estimate. What are we even trying to do in this study? Uh, then we're going to use that to design uh, some scientific model, a causal model. And this can start out as a DAG, but it eventually needs to be generative. Um, we use steps one and two to build some series of statistical models, which address the specific estimates and can be justified in light of the causal models in step two. And then in step four, we do testing. We simulate from the generative model to validate that the estimator works. And then in step five, we analyze the real data. And there may be additional steps after this. We might decide uh, to loop back and revise the causal models. But as long as we document all that, uh, this is the workflow that we want to draw the owl. OK, that's really all the material I wanted to get through in this first lecture, talking about DAGs, golems, and owls, just to review. Uh, the point of DAGs, this is a stand-in for all kinds of causal modeling, not just direct, directed acyclic graphs. DAGs uh, and other causal models provide transparent scientific assumptions to communicate those assumptions to our colleagues. They allow us to uh, inspect them ourselves, and this justifies our effort. Um, it exposes our assumptions to critique, and it lets us logically build golems, statistical models, that can credibly get at the estimates we declare. And these golems, uh, this is my metaphor for models, statistical models in this course, they're brainless, powerful statistical devices. Uh, we need them, but we have to use them responsibly and ethically. And then finally, owls, this is our workflow. We're going to hold ourselves to a clear workflow that integrates DAGs with golems and documents it. Uh, so we provide some quality assurance so that uh, our colleagues and the public can take our work seriously. So I think there's a, a strong uh, argument for reciprocity between all the stages of this. And I tried to illustrate that jokingly on this screen with rock, paper, scissor. Think about the relationships between theories and, and um, scientific theories allow us to, to design statistical models, statistical procedures that can, that can test their assumptions. Uh, so theories, in a sense, dominate models. Um, models uh, uh, are needed to process evidence, and then evidence uh, critiques theories. So no single part of this uh, workflow and uh, scientific theorizing in general 
is more important than all the others. And every little bit of code you write in statistical procedures is just as important as the grand theorizing uh, that the greatest scientists have ever done uh, because it can, well, uh, kill theories. Uh, and so we're going to go forward in this course and I'm going to teach you how to kill some theories. Uh, we're going to have 10 weeks of instruction. Um, I might revise uh, the particular topics in each week a little bit as we go, because remember, I'm, I'm rapidly revising for the third edition as I go. Uh, but I think it'll mostly be uh, this organization. Up through the first five weeks, it's basically a, a course in uh, regression, in Bayesian regression, in light of causal uh, inference. So I'll teach you how to use DAGs and teach you about confounders and colliders and fun things like that. In the second half of the course, we get into more specialized topics and talk about um, multi-level models and latent variable models and social network models and phylogenetic models and other sorts of things. Uh, but the tools all the way through, it's the same basic Golem engine that I will teach you in the next lecture.